So thanks again to Boris. Our next speaker will be coming to the stage shortly. Our next speaker's name is Jeremy. So Jeremy Glassenberg is the product lead APIs at DocuSign. Jeremy's presentation will address designing embedded platforms, lessons from industry success and failures. So Jeremy, when you are ready, please feel free to share your screen. All righty. Um, let's see, is that is that working? It's working, we see it. Great, yeah, we've had a, a multiple complications this morning and uh, glad to see it's, uh, it's functional now. Awesome. Thank you. All righty. Well, thank you. It's uh, great to great to meet you all. Um, my name's Jeremy, uh, doing the product management and API thing over at DocuSign, as was mentioned. And today we'll be talking about embedded integration uh, frameworks, embedded integration platforms, and basically the successes and challenges that we've seen over the most recent years. We're actually going to go through a little bit of the history of these frameworks, how things have failed in the past, and what we've learned from those to see successes. We're gonna talk about the user experience as well as the technical challenges uh, and needs behind them. Uh, I'll go next into my most hated slide, which I think we can go through very quickly over here, the About Me slide. Basically, I've been working on APIs for a little over 13 years now, most well known for managing the developer platform at Box in the early days, been deeply involved in various aspects of the, uh, the API community. And yeah, currently I'm working on uh, APIs over a DocuSign. Now, um, I've had this experience going way back to 2008 and earlier, actually 2005, really, um, in, is, is going to be kind of useful in the, in the talk today on the topic of, of embedded frameworks. We will actually go back through the history that starts with this rise and fall back in that 2005 to 2008 period, um, and then again over the last few years. So let's dive right in. One moment. Okay, so let's go back to that period from 05 to 08. Uh, many of you have seen this slide from Programmable Web, which highlights that 2009 API craze, where prior to 2009, APIs were definitely around, but suddenly it just became an expected item that every tech company needed to have there was a sudden obsession where everyone wanted to start building out APIs. And for those who remember the years before 2009, the folk like me who I guess were in APIs before they were cool, not that we're hipsters, definitely not hipsters, um, but we saw what APIs were like before 08. And what we're gonna be talking about today is something that was popular back then and then seemingly forgotten. I'm curious among you who may remember a few of these things that we're going to, a few of these examples we want to highlight. The first being uh, iGoogle. Curious if anyone remembers this back in uh, 2005. It was basically an alternative homepage by Google uh, that was highly customizable, where you can choose to have a weather app, a calculator, a calendar app, and third parties were eventually able to build their own apps. Um, from a technical standpoint, this was just about iframing a bunch of different pages into iGoogle. This thing was, you know, a big, it got a lot of attention to Google, but it quietly faded out. Uh, and likewise, related to this was something called Open Social. You may remember Facebook around the same time announcing Facebook Canvas, where third party apps were part of the Facebook interface. Uh, LinkedIn and others had something like this. Uh, at Box, we were a launch partner to this program that LinkedIn had, where third-party apps um, could actually be part of your LinkedIn profile. You could install, say, Box and choose a profile um, folder uh, that could be like a portfolio folder. So you could highlight content that you posted in Box right on your LinkedIn profile. Uh, so the idea here was to have just these third-party integrations in your interface, one way or another, mostly through iframing. And unfortunately, they didn't really pan out, even though there was really a lot of this. At the time, the idea was to make the web services so customizable and flexible that the web really looked like and acted like an operating system. In fact, there was actually a, a Y Combinator startup that literally tried to do that, a UOS that actually wanted to create a web page 
uh, that was going to operate as like a web operating system where you could install apps that were mostly just JavaScript web-based things on this web page that looked like, like a desktop. Uh, this thing didn't really pan out either. There were a lot of really cool ideas here and they were unfortunately spectacular failures. So what happened? Well, basically at the time, ideas like this, we would say like, they look kind of cool, but what was really the point? What were the use cases around these? And therein lay the challenge. Um, so I like to come at this problem from a product manager's perspective. And I always highlight this one thing you need to know as a product manager. The quote, if you build it, they will come. It's really not that good an idea. It tends not to work in real life. Um, in fact, the quote comes from the movie Field of Dreams, uh, where, you know, it's an old enough movie, I can share a little bit of a spoiler to it. Uh, they basically build a baseball field, and that's what they build. And what actually comes are the ghosts of the uh, White Sox players who took a bribe to throw a World Series. Uh, so when you think about it, even in the movie where this quote comes from, just building it doesn't actually necessarily attract the right kind of customers you want. Product process is all about understanding who will be the customers, what kind of problems do they have, and then what kind of solutions can you build according to that. And if you build based on problems and start to apply use cases, will we actually start to see results. So actually, one other thing I want to highlight before we get into that, um, before 09, during, actually, even during the 09 craze, we kind of ran into this challenge that a lot of APIs are getting thrown out there without use cases. Some of the APIs were successful. Many of them weren't. But to many companies, if they launched an API and it didn't work out, okay, many developers are bothered by it, but the core customers, you know, you can shut things down quietly. Maybe they don't see it. These sort of things, I Google, embedding things in your own website, like in LinkedIn, Customers were using it, embedding it, seeing it on the website. And so when these things were shutting down, they were more visible and more painful. Consequently, over the course of many years, as APIs got popular, this thing kind of faded out. But they're having a comeback as companies start to apply product process. So when we see companies like Google and the Gmail team implementing Gmail add-ons, thinking through where does it make sense for Gmail users? Where do they want to see a third-party solution be part of this experience? Trello, hmm, do we want third parties to live in our cards, on the boards, for project management? They were really thinking through what do customers want and accordingly finding third-party solutions and making it work. The results? We're now over the last four or five years seeing success in the space. Gmail add-ons now has thousands of integrations, many of whom have reported significant income. Trello's power-ups has resulted in significant growth for Trello. Shopify, it's over a $100 billion company today. Much of their growth was attributed to their developer platform. So these companies, by applying product principles, are starting to see results by actually allowing third-party apps in their experience today. And I've actually gone to, for a book in progress, interview um, hosts and, and folks working at all these companies over a few years to gather what were their secrets, what were their mistakes, what were their lessons learned, what really did they figure out to understand what makes for success in these platforms. First and foremost, at the highest level, yeah, it's applying product process. And um, basically, don't just plop iframes or enable integrations where you think it's just going to look cool. Don't do it just because you can. Um, if you do that, you're not going to look cool. You're going to look like someone who looked cool in the 80s. And the 80s wasn't cool. Uh, what you have to do is have real use cases. In fact, several of the hosts of these successful platforms have, have shared with me that they didn't start the platform the embedded aspect of their platform until they literally saw customers trying to hack solutions, trying to inject content into their websites. Like Gmail was able to test the waters by enabling a script in Gmail such that people could write 
Chrome extensions and browser extensions to customize the Gmail experience. They tried things out that way before enabling this as an official platform. Over at Shopify, they saw customers actually trying to use their APIs to build their own interface and then customize it. So they literally saw customers trying to hack a solution and that's how they knew that there was demand. Speaking of which, it's really not going to make sense to launch something like this until you already have users from which you can gather feedback. Now, I give a talk um, at a product management program that's two and a half hours long on app marketplace management, and we don't have time for that here. What I'll just highlight is that these embedded frameworks are a marketplace problem. Uh, when you are allowing apps to be part of your interface, the value you're providing to them is that you are going to make them accessible to your users. In general, they're not going to bring you new customers. Over time, they might, but most of the time, this is about providing a better experience for your existing customers, maybe for upsell, maybe for customer loyalty. Um, but you're not going to really understand the use cases where it makes sense to build this platform until you have users already on your business, already on your site, trying things out, hacking solutions, and then you'll learn from this what makes sense to implement for your platform. Okay, now let's get into the cooler stuff. What actually can we build? How should we actually build these sort of platforms? So I like to look at this in terms of three kinds of technologies that result in different kinds of user experiences. Uh, first and foremost are iframes, the oldest, still the most prominent, the easiest to set up. We'll dive into this a little bit more. Um, cards, this is what you see in Slack and Gmail, which have their pros and cons. They're newer, they have their challenges, but they're trending. And triggers, which I really should just define as miscellaneous. It's basically what else are we seeing besides just the basic have a UI embedded in your page? There are other things we can look at. Let's dive a little bit more into this. First, the iframes. Okay, it seems to still be working. All right, so for iframes, this is the most common. This is the only thing we saw really back in 05 to 08. The basic idea is you allow another web page to be embedded in your own page. This has been around in the internet you know, since the 90s. Uh, so it's an easy solution. It allows third parties to have full control over what they want to do, full freedom to be part of your interface, which, as you all know, can have way, way, way more cons than pros, namely in security but also in performance. So security means even if you've trusted this partner, even if you've done a review of this partner, if they get compromised, if they get hacked, they might do something that actually affects your site where you're also embedding their solution. Um, but also many platform services have confided in me that when their platform was launched and when they shut them down, sometimes it was a performance issue that if they allowed more than one integration on a page, um, it really just slowed down the page and things just weren't working. Uh, now, this is still very popular. Um, Google's workspace was using both iframes and what we'll get to next, cards, which is the trending technology. The idea here is to have more control at the platform layer over what your partners can actually build in your interface. You're going to limit them to not be able to write any sort of script that can have a performance implication. And so this has security benefits, it has performance benefits, it also has a usability benefit. One reason why this has become popular, if we look at say Slack and Gmail, um, among others who've done this, some of these platform providers have told me that they, in some cases they did it because their security teams required it, saying we're not gonna allow an iframe. But in other cases, it was actually because they had such a heavy mobile presence that their customers were using their mobile apps so often, they thought cards would make a better experience. And that really is the case. Iframes and mobile apps don't play well together. This was a big advantage for, say, Gmail. Uh, when they enabled Gmail add-ons, it meant that these cards that you were building, sure, you were limited in the user experience, but... Your app didn't just work in Gmail for the web. It actually works in the Gmail mobile app. And that's really only possible through, through cards. Uh, that said, we've had um, 
still many challenges with this. And many companies I advise, they've sometimes given up on implementing integrations with cards just because they're just too limited in functionality. Uh, what I'm happy to say is I've seen over the last couple of years improvements and learnings. So these are improving, but every platform hosts acknowledges developers get frustrated when building to cards. They understand the reasoning, but it's limited. Um, now, one solution to all of this is simply to kind of combine the two. So uh, this, this I've actually seen at Intercom where they recommend to just use cards as much as possible. But if you absolutely need to do something outside of the card because the cards are too limited, yes, you can iframe. It's something I recommend for those who are implementing um, cards more for the mobile experience um, than for security. And hopefully there's time to get a little bit into security today, but I may get buzzed since we had a late start. My apologies. And still trying to get to the next slide. All right, so trying to go quickly here, but I want to emphasize, think about the iframe, but also look into cards. They're a challenge, but those tend to be trending. And I really want to emphasize, think through those use cases and maybe think outside of the box. What else just makes sense for your customers when you're allowing partners to become part of your interface? At Box and Google Drive, they didn't rely on iframes or anything. They had a system where you could just right click on say a file and view a bunch of integration options. And if you click on one, it would just open up um, a new window. That just made sense. So for some of these operations, they operated server side. So you would just choose to say, send a file via, to, through fax via eFax and the file could get faxed behind the scenes. We didn't need an iframe for this. We didn't need a card, we just needed an icon and some text, and then behind the scenes, some instructions to how to actually make this integration, uh, make this integration work. All right, um, feel free to buzz me. I know we're gonna be a little short on time here, but I wanna highlight besides the different types of technologies to consider for your developer experience, iframes or cards or other means to enable integrations what can we provide to make things easier for your developers to enable them to actually build on a platform like this? Um, first thing to consider, have API specifically around your embed framework. Um, as an example for Google Docs and Gmail, there are certain APIs that just aren't meant for apps living outside of Gmail and Google Docs. They're meant just to interact within the Gmail interface. Often they're functions that can actually trigger an event inside of say Gmail. So you can literally as the user work within that limited iframe or card interface, but see and interact with other parts of Gmail and Google Docs. So think about what APIs make sense just for your platform. Going beyond that, any good API is gonna have at least some sort of API library or SDK. In the world of embed frameworks, it's especially helpful to have a JavaScript library. Um, why? Because many developers will like to, if their content is being hosted in the interface, be able to code this thing entirely in client-side code and minimize the amount of server-side code that they need to run. In fact, and there's, there's not much time for this today, but you'll see many platforms providing hosted solutions where you can host the code on the developer platform that's uh, going to be embedding this. Um, so you don't have to host your code anywhere. And this is much easier to do if the code is strictly client-side JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, and nothing major on the server side. There are server-side solutions. We don't have time to go into those, but long story short, that's a lot harder to implement. Uh, and finally, think about embedded interfaces. How do you make it easier for developers to just interact with your API through, say, components um, that they're commonly going to use. Shopify was big on this, Salesforce was big on this with something like Visual Force, where they give you a UI that already calls their APIs, an extension of say a JavaScript library. It makes it easier to build an app with a nice interface, but also ensures these apps as they're embedded in your interface, they have a kind of consistent UI to it. You know, it's nice if 
all these third parties highlight their experience and their UI. But sometimes it's also nice when you're in Gmail, even if all these things are working with partners, they look to a degree the same. And you can make that easier for developers by providing tools like pre-built UI components to do that. Okay, I don't think I'm getting buzzed to stop yet, so I will take at least one more minute to talk about security. Uh, and yes, for any platform like this, you need more than a minute to talk about and think about security. But um, yeah, there are many, many implications in security. As I mentioned, sometimes the decision of what technology to use here is literally just based on your security team and uh, not, and, and basically saying you can't do iframes or something else. Uh, in the world of iframes, if you want to argue for iframes, thanks to HTML5, been around for a while, but they have made iframes a lot easier than they used to be. So it can alleviate some of the negative connotation. Basically, you can at least restrict an iframe app from having pop ups, having JavaScript if needed. I think we're down to 30 seconds here. I just want to also highlight, watch your scopes. In addition to thinking about APIs just for these frameworks, think about scopes. These especially embedded apps may have more limit, may have a need for more restriction, less freedom than, than other APIs. They don't necessarily need access to everything. In Google Drive, if I'm right clicking on a file, to say fax a document or edit an image, that file may need rewrite access just to one file not everything in Google Drive, and Google's consider this in their scopes and permissions for apps just embedded. All right, that's basically it that I have for today. I will just emphasize to everyone, keep dreaming. Look at the trends, keep thinking about how you can make your interface better by letting third parties enhance it. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for that wonderful presentation. I think we probably have time for one question, and so you know, I'll just jump right in. You know, I, you were talking a lot about these wonderful innovations, and I'm wondering if you can speak to any innovative, um, any incentives, excuse me, to attract the right of um, the right type of people to do this work. Yeah, so um, that is a very good question, and I kind of alluded to this being a marketplace challenge. Um, we could talk for hours about handling an app marketplace, but think about supply and demand here. Embedded frameworks or the benefit will be to partners that you are giving them access to your customers. It's less that you're bringing, that they're bringing you customers and more that you are bringing them customers. So first and foremost, what are the kinds of problems that your customers have and then work from there. Now what I've also learned here is you can give as much of a value prop as possible by showing them demand. In fact, the first partners we're able to attract when it comes to developer relations are the partners where we literally have customers asking for that integration. We can say, hey, if you build this thing right now, we will put you directly in touch with a partner. You have guaranteed revenue through that customer. Um, in other cases, you know, it's just you provide, say, a ref share on the process of marketing. Um, I've encouraged partners when they're entering the first time, if we don't have clear demand, to build an MVP. Start light and build from there. I don't want to overpromise what they're going to make. Um, I've also learned to keep the number of apps to a certain limit, actually until you see the demand. I've been in situations where we have so many apps and the company that I'm working for is so happy about it, but I emphasize it's not about how many apps you have. You have to look at the overall health of the ecosystem. Wonderful. Thank you, Jeremy. And so can you just let us know how folks can get in contact with you before, before we um, wrap up? Yeah, let me just share my email here. It's uh, just first name, last name at DocuSign. Uh, can't seem to post it to the group chat. I just posted it to private chat, but um, sure, if you can reshare that. Yeah, For feel sure. free to reach out to me with any other questions. Will do. Thank you so much, and we hope you have a wonderful conference. Thanks. You as well, everyone. Good to meet you all.